Whose ball was that? If you ever asked that question, this video is for you because there are nine common mistakes players are constantly making when it comes to court positioning. And chances are you're making at least one of them and that's leading to you and your partner losing points. So today we're gonna walk through all of those mistakes, show how you can fix them, and help you and your partner start plugging all the holes in the court so that you're surprising your opponents with how you always seem to be there. But first, how should you position yourselves as a team if one of you is getting targeted? This was the most common question asked by the inner circle, and I uh, asked the inner circle before every video to make sure that their biggest, most important question is answered, and this was the big question this time. It's actually a really interesting question because it has less to do with positioning than it has to do with dinking. We're gonna talk about all these different ways you need to position, and you definitely should be doing that whether or not one of you are being targeted, but when you're being targeted, it doesn't really matter where the two of you are standing because the opponents are always gonna be able to keep targeting the player that they wanna target. What makes it more difficult for them to target that player is where that targeted player dinks the ball. Typically what I see is that when a player is getting targeted, they're just gonna keep going cross court over and over and over. And if you watch mixed doubles, especially at the just below pro level, like the 5-0 level, you see gr the girls just dinking sharp cross court over and over again, playing keep away from the two guys. And if one of the guys gets the ball, they're trying to get it back to the girl too. What actually makes it easier for the iced out player to get involved in the point is if the dinks stop going so sharp, but start going towards the middle or even down the line. When it's sharp, the, the player that's getting iced out has to cover the line, which makes it difficult for them to come in, take any dinks or poach at all. If you hit the dink in the middle or down the line, things change. If it goes in the middle, then the player doesn't have to cover the line as much anymore. And they can sit more in the middle and reach in either here or here, or even take a few steps over and take a dink. And if the isolated player dinks down the line, they're either gonna start getting into a down the line dink rally, which is uncomfortable for both players, or the player in front of them is gonna dink it cross court because typically players are more comfortable hitting it cross court, which might get, get the iced out player the opportunity to hit the ball. So try that. And then if you incorporate all of the positioning tips that we're gonna go over in this video with that knowledge, you're going to be way more successful when you are getting isolated. Now, on to mistake number one. I have this vivid, vivid memory of the first time I ever got beat down the line off an opponent hitting a speed up off the bounce. I was covering the line on my left side, just playing the point, and my partner dinked it wide to my friend Ollie, and he just went like this and phew, looped it beautifully down the line right past me. It whizzed right by me. I didn't even see it coming. I was stunned because I was already moving back towards the middle of the court, kind of shading with the ball. I didn't even think it was a possibility that he was gonna hit it there. From that point on, I knew that I needed to hard cover the line anytime the ball was hit out wide and I was in front of the ball. I couldn't assume that they were just gonna dink it back cross court. And as I started playing with better players with more weapons, this became very common. Oh, yeah. If you ever left it open, and, and they would find an opportunity to take advantage of that and thread a ball right past you on both sides. So this was mistake number one, not covering the lines, which brings me to number two. So I started covering the lines really well, but one pattern that would get me is when the player I was dinking with would pull me out wide with a wide dink, I would dink it back, and then I wouldn't get back to the middle in time before they would poke the ball right between me and my partner for a winner, right through the middle. What I was failing to do is shading, which means moving with the ball. When I got pulled out wide and I dinked it back cross court, I needed to follow the ball and plug the middle because like me, that day I got passed down the line, my partner now needs to cover the line. So they can't be responsible for covering the middle and covering the middle becomes my job. And I fixed that with learning how to shade and started getting beat with winners a lot less often. So if my ball is over there, if I hit to that side of the court, me and Drew are generally gonna shift over a little bit like this so that he can cover the line and I covered the middle, okay? It's very unlikely they're gonna hit a super hard shot into that section of the court. This mistake was a real eye-opener for me because it happened when I was pretty early on in my pickleball journey and I was probably around 4-0, maybe 4-5 and had the opportunity to play with like the, the good group at my local park. I got paired up with um, who, now a pro uh, women's player and there was a point where she was returning and our opponents hit a big drive down the middle. 
but it wasn't on my side of the court. It was on her side of the court, and so I left it for her because I was so self-conscious about taking other people's balls, especially if I was gonna hit a bad shot or make an error. She was only halfway up in through the transition zone. That drive, I could have comfortably just reached over and hit a volley, but I thought it was the right thing to do to let her hit that ball because she's a better player than me, and I didn't want to take a ball that was hers and, you know, get embarrassed. She expected me to hit the ball, then reached, popped the ball up, and then our opponents smacked it down on us. And she kindly told me, um, when you can, help me out. Reach over, grab that ball. And that is one of the first court positioning lessons that developing players have to learn. To know when they should reach over and not play 50-50 so that they can help their partner, especially when they're making their way up to the kitchen. Now, a third shot that's hit through the middle isn't the only time you might wanna reach over and help your partner out and take a ball. It can happen on dinks too. And this is partially why that middle dink is so deadly at lower levels of play. Because players don't usually know whose ball that is. At higher levels of play, it's pretty obviously the player with the forehand. So if you watch any pro level play, you almost always have that left side player with the forehand taking the majority of the dinks, 60, 70, maybe 80% of the court. But at amateur levels, you play way more closer to 50-50 and it can cause confusion when a ball lands in the middle of the court. Now, I think this channel in general is targeted at tournament players. So the best way to position is probably to have that dominant player take a lot more of those dinks. But if you're playing rack and everybody's playing 50-50, then you might want to dink like that. The key thing here is to communicate and decide with your partner who gets those dinks in the middle. It's as easy as saying, hey, when you're on the left side, take the middle dinks with your forehand. Or um, let's just play 50-50. I'll take all the dinks on my side. You take all the dinks on your side. Now, there is a ball that I don't think you should really be playing 50-50 even if you're playing ruck, and that's a put away. If you get a high floating ball at the kitchen line and one player has a forehand that they can comfortably reach, even though they have to you know, cross the 50-50 mark a little bit, I think they should take it because it's gonna help you develop much better habits to place the offense on your team where it can have the biggest impact. And a put away shot where somebody has a forehand is kind of the most common one that you're gonna see. Um, so in this case, I think simply saying mine reaching over, hitting that ball, usually a pretty good idea. When you start a hands battle, it can be tempting to leave a ball in the middle of that firefight for your partner if it's heading in the direction. But one thing you don't start to appreciate until you find yourself in more and more hands battles is that when you're not an active participant in the hands battle, it's really hard to jump into it because when you're hitting the ball over and over again, you're tracking the ball really intensely. But when you're not, you're sitting there, you're just trying to keep track of it and not get surprised when your opponent hits the ball in your direction. So that's why it's oftentimes much better for the player that is active in the hands battle to keep continuing the hands battle, even if it means having them hold way over in one direction or the other. They're, they have a much better chance of making clean contact with that ball because they're in the middle of that battle. Something, a mistake that I was making often was in the middle of a hands battle, if I saw that the ball was going over to my partner's side of the court, I might leave it, even if I could have reached it and continued the hands battle. That's happened to me too. My partner starts a hands battle, I'm sitting there shaking in my boots, just hoping that I can hit the right shot. And they could have reached over and continued the hands battle, but they said yours and you know I make a mistake. So. Play, play around with it when you're in a hands battle. See what it feels like to see it through. All within reason, of course, if the ball is going way over to your partner's side and you can't reach it, don't hit a worse shot than they can hit. But keep in mind that the shot you're hitting, as long as you can reach it, is you have a much better chance of hitting it cleanly than your partner. The math on whether you should be hitting that ball typically tilts in your favor. So far, all of the rules have been about right to left movement, lateral movement on the court. But um, front to back movement, up and down movement is just as important. And one of the most important skills you have to develop and deal with at higher levels is defense. The thing that really stunned me about playing with 5-0s and pros for the first time was just how many balls that they were getting back. I couldn't imagine getting back some of the putaways that 
I was hitting on them. But they would just scramble back, reset, scramble back, reset, scramble back, lob. And then before I knew it, they were at the kitchen again. I was kicking myself for not ending the point. And the main reason they're able to do that is when they feel like they're in trouble, they instinctively take a couple steps off the kitchen line to give themselves a little more time to stay in the point. And if they see that it's a really bad situation, like their opponents can really slam the ball, they might scramble back as far as they can, split step right before their opponents make contact with the ball and then just try to dig it out and make their way back in. What I was doing was kind of giving up and spinning around trying to protect my body when I saw that that ball was um, about to be hit hard at me. Now I scramble back and reset it and I'm kind of amazed at how often you can stay in the point and make your way back to neutral. So not backing up when you're in trouble, mistake number eight. Now all of these mistakes so far have been targeting tournament play. They're all lessons learned watching pros play and try to win games to the best of their ability. And if the other players on the court aren't on the same page as you, not reading the room can create awkward situations on the pickleball court. So not all of these movements, especially the ones where you're reaching over and not playing 50-50, even though they're the most winning strategies, they might not always make sense depending on the context of your game. So the final mistake is not communicating. Make sure, make sure you're constantly talking to your partner about how you want to cover the court. And talk during the point too. Someone should always be calling out yours or mine so that if there's ever any ambiguity over whose ball it is, you try to clear it up. This is just a great habit to develop in general because at the highest levels of play, teammates are constantly in communication with each other, which helps them move as one unit rather than two individuals scrambling to figure out how to win the point. Fixing these positioning mistakes will help you win games, especially if you've made it to the kitchen, but they won't help you get to the kitchen. So if you want to win a lot more games, watch this video on getting to the kitchen. I go over the nine rules that you must follow when you're trying to get to the kitchen. And I promise you're breaking at least one of them.